Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of House of the Dragon episode 10, the season finale, The Black Queen. And this video is brought to you by Pluto TV, the free streaming platform offering free movies and shows that are 100% free 100% of the time. This finale is exactly why I don't bring my bitey rescue dog to the dog park. Damn it, darling, now we gotta run before Karen Gulch throws you in her bike basket. Let us break down this epic finale frame by frame for the Game of Thrones connections, easy to miss details, and deeper layers of meaning. Quick detail about the opening credits. When we see the stone dials from Rhaenyra and Damon's kids, Aegon the Younger and Viserys, there is not a third dial for Visenya, even though past instances have shown dials for unborn descendants waiting for the bloodline to reach them, already predestined on that stone. But since Visenya was never going to live, there is no dial for her. We open on Aegon the Conqueror's painted table, showing the northern part of Westeros, the wall, and the castle at the west end of the wall, Shadow Tower, basically the northwestern tip of the known world from the Targaryen's perspective. The camera glides down past Winterfell, White Harbor, the Barrowlands, Moat Kaelin, the neck and other towns. This is essentially how every episode of Game of Thrones would begin, the camera gliding down over a map of Westeros. Rhaenyra's second son, Luke, runs his hand across Driftmark and restates his hesitation to take over Driftmark as Lord of the Tides, something he told Corlys back in episode seven. From the Lord of Driftmark. It means everyone's dead. For Luke, his role as a pawn in the schemes of the adults has always haunted him. For him, with duty comes death. Rhaenyra says, We don't choose our destiny, Luke. It chooses us. Again, coming back to the stone dials in the opening credits, each dial for every living descendant is preset in stone before the bloodline even reaches it. All of this is part of a destined path. The bloodline chooses the person. Rhaenyra promises Luke that she will prepare him for his duties as her father prepared her. Oh no. This scene takes on a new layer of irony after the episode's ending. Rhaenyra cannot possibly prepare Luke for his bloodshed that's to come, just as Viserys couldn't possibly prepare Rhaenyra for the treachery that would engulf the realm after his death. Sir Laurent Marbrand, one of the few knights of the Seven King's Guard we haven't met yet until this point, announces Rhaenys has arrived with Melis. Rhaenys gets right to the news of Viserys' death and she continues, There is more. Aegon has been crowned as his successor. <laughs> Yes, Rhaenyra winces from a contraction right as she hears the news of Aegon supplanting her. But even from the moment Rhaenys had said there is more, notice how Rhaenyra gets hit with a bit of the dizzies as if she is bracing for that other shoe to drop. It's fun to watch Damon in the scene. Clearly all he can think about is how someone murdered his brother from the moment he sniffed that milk of the poppy in Viserys' cup in episode eight. We should note that Lyman Beesbury also jumped to the conclusion of regicide. Rhaenys says, The High Septon crowned Aegon in the dragon pit. I witnessed it myself just before I fled on Melis. Yeah, it seems like just the mention of Aegon's name triggers another early contraction. The rushed crowning of her half-brother syncs with the rushed crowning of her child. And I love Ramin Jawadi's music here. Yeah, it sounds like Jawadi's using some rock distortion, maybe some electric cello, electric upright bass. It recalls Hans Zimmer's music for Inception. The opening zhong zhong, boom boom. The opening booms of Edith Piaf's song slow down to convey the countdown of a dream coming to an end. For Rhaenyra, time is also running out, and Viserys' dream of the dragons roaring as one is also coming to an end. Now, Damon, who has spent most of this season silent, motormouths through some commands in this finale than he does in the entire other nine episodes put together. If the Greens attack now, it will be by stealth, not directly. We don't have enough men to surround the island, but we can make ourselves appear stronger than they are. Throughout all this, Rhaenyra's pained screams echo through the castle, distracting these lords from trying to carry out business. Now, by comparison, the Red Keep is more closed off and segmented, so the physical state of the sovereign there can be kept hidden, but here, everyone in Dragonstone knows everything. It's that open concept interior design, it always gets you. Also, Daemon is echoing his brother Viserys about the true nature of Targaryen power. It's a trick, it's an illusion. Casting a large shadow to make your enemies think you're more of a threat than you actually are. Jace and Luke spar on the beach as Jace goes way too hard on his younger brother, showing how Luke is just a sweet summer child. He is not prepared for this war. The two boys are brought in front of Rhaenyra while she is in labor, because she is worried she might die the way her mother Emma did. And she wants to make sure Jace knows that he is her heir, whatever happens to her. He asks, and where is Damon? I don't know. Gone to madness. Gone to plot his war. Yeah, plot his war. Rhaenyra recognizes that Daemon was already looking for any excuse to wage war against the Greens. Daemon's council continues to scheme with plans to reach out to allies in the Crownlands, including House Darklyn, that's Sir Stefan's house from Duskendale, House Massey from Stone Dance, and House Bar Amon from Sharp Point. Daemon plans to fly to River Run to secure House Tully, and he refuses to check in with the Maester and ignores Jace at first. If you think about it, trying to stage his own coup until he is called out. Now, the most vocal lord at all these meetings, other than Daemon, is Bartimos Keltigar. 
Rengar, the wealthy Lord of Claw Isle in the Crownlands, and a key member of Rhaenyra's council going forward. Damon takes Luke to force Sir Laurent and Sir Stefan to reaffirm their allegiance to Rhaenyra. And in this scene, you can see the burns on Damon's neck, which Damon actually received when he got hit with that flaming arrow during the prior battles for the Stepstones back at the beginning of episode three. Just love the continuity there. Damon uses Caraxes to intimidate the knights. Yeah, notice how Caraxes slips a little on that boulder. Just a reminder that these dragons are not perfect, majestic, godly creatures. They're awkward, somewhat clumsy oafs who are too big for this world and not entirely in control. And so we should not expect them to perfectly obey their boyish master's commands in the final battle. Damon says that if the knights declare their loyalty to the usurper now, they'll get a clean death, but if they turn their coats later... Know that you will die. Screaming. <laughs> <laughs> And we cut to Rhaenyra screaming, herself close to death. Her labor pains intercut with these shots of a dragon. We think it might be Cyrax, but it actually might be another one, what she envisions her unborn child to be. Because in the text, the baby Visenya is a stillborn as it is in the show, but the biased account of Mushroom claims that the child was born with dragon-like birth defects, including a stubby scaled tail. Here, Rhaenyra does scream, get it out, which is a slight change from her line in the book, monster, monster, get it out. Obviously, the scene is horrifying and extremely uncomfortable to watch, I'm not going to go into the visuals of it, but I will say it looked like the umbilical cord was wrapped around the throat, as opposed to this baby having some dragon-like birth defects. But Rhaenyra's fear of giving birth to a literal dragon does remind us of her mother Emma's line in episode one. After this miserable pregnancy, I wouldn't be surprised if I hatched an actual dragon. It is a reminder that dragons and dreams are the strength of this family, but they're also their own downfall. The child's remains are burned on an altar in the same spot where Rhaenyra and Daemon were married in the secret ceremony at the end of episode seven. Sir Eric Cargill arrives and presents King Viserys' crown, meaning he must have stolen it from the corpse, perhaps during Aegon's crowning in the dragon pit or in the aftermath. In the books, it's Sir Stefan Darklin who steals the crown. He reaffirms his Kingsguard vows and Daemon takes the crown and looks at it closely. Notice to the right of the Targaryen sigil is the lion of House Lannister. On the other side of it, which we see when it's on her head, is the Tully Fish and the Baratheon Stag. All the major houses are represented on this crown. This is a crown worn by King Jaehaerys. Daemon crowns Rhaenyra just as he placed this crown on the head of his brother in episode eight. In both cases, you do get the sense that Daemon wanted this crown for himself, but just had to resign to hand it off to another. Daemon kneels, followed by everyone else, but not Rhaenys. She later says she must wait for her lord husband Corlys to decide the fealty of House Valerion before she can bend the knee to anyone. But you also get the sense that as the queen who never was, she's always been queen in her own mind. Candles are lit on a tray that slid underneath the painted table to illuminate the dragon glass from beneath. Like Aegon the Conqueror's dagger, secrets were hidden by pyromancers that are only revealed by fire. Queen Rhaenyra is marched in and she takes the same route through Dragonstone that Daenerys does in that Game of Thrones season seven long walk promo. Remember how great that was? That was like the first footage of Game of Thrones we got after the season six finale. Might have been the last time everyone still liked Game of Thrones. Oh, the nostalgia. So the painted table illuminates and we see the south end of it only extends to the Stormlands. Dorn was not included on the Conqueror's table because it was the one part of the continent that he was unable to conquer. I also love the Mufasa-ness of this. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Jace assumes the role of placing the figurines on the map. On Dragonstone, he places the Targaryen sigil, the tallest one that's painted black. On King's Landing, the Hightower lighthouse painted green. As Rhaenyra walks in, she awkwardly has to signal her escort to stop following her. She's new to this. She's still figuring out the protocol of moving like a ruler. We learn that Reyna is Rhaenyra's cupbearer, as Rhaenyra was a cupbearer to Viserys. It's a very important role because Rhaenyra includes Reyna at the table along with her sister Bela. Moves that she clearly made to appeal to Rhaenys, whose support she is still angling to secure. Rhaenyra proves herself a very competent ruler in the way that she handles Rhaenys. For the houses already declaring their names, they mark with black figurines on the table. For their enemies, they mark with the green figurines. And for the ones that they are targeting as flippable, like Winterfell, Riverrun, the Eyrie, and Storm's End, they mark with golden ones. Daemon does some dragon math for us. They have three adults by my count. We have Cyrax, Caraxes, and Melis. Your sons have Virmax, Arax, and Tyraxes. Bela has Moondancer. Yeah, I love that reaction shot on Rhaenys, having her dragon conscripted without her consent, just like the Greens tried to do to her in King's Landing last episode. Damon goes on. There are also unclaimed dragons. Sea Smoke still resides on Driftmark. Vermithor and Silverwing dwell on the Dragon Mount. Still riderless. 
Then there are the three wild dragons, all of whom nest here. Yes, confirming Lanor's dragon Sea Smoke remains on Drift Market, did not follow him to Essos. Vermithor, the Bronze Fury, was the dragon of Jaehaerys first. Silverwing was the dragon of Jaehaerys' wife, Alysanne, the dragon she famously flew to Winterfell and the Wall. Also, yes, you probably noticed we cut to Reyna right after Damon says some dragons are riderless because she remains the one of these kids not to be bonded with a dragon for now. So Damon adds it up. 13 dragons for the blacks, four for the greens. He says four, even though he only mentioned three. The fourth dragon is Tessarion, the she-dragon that is ridden by Allison's fourth child, Darren, who is left off screen this season, but confirmed to have been in Old Town all this time. We're gonna meet him in season two. Damon says, We need a place to gather, a toehold, large enough to house a sizable host. Here at Harrenhal, we cut off the west, surround King's Landing with the dragons, and we could have every greenhead mounted on spikes before the moon turns. Harrenhal was where the season began, in that Great Council of 101. Now it's interesting how Harrenhal is written on the map, but not the God's Eye Lake or any of the geographic features. Only the cities are labeled. I think it shows how the Conqueror didn't really care as much about the land or the rivers. We did learn a couple episodes back that he just cut down all the trees. It makes sense because on Dragonback, he could soar over all of this. He really only cares about the people and their castles. By the way, the page for Harrenhal has apparently been the most viewed fandom wiki page for a location all season long. We've been big fans of their wikis for Star Wars, the MCU, and House of the Dragon. They're the world's largest fan wiki platform, and we thank them for partnering with us on this breakdown. Sir Eric announces Otto's arrival. A ship has been sighted offshore. A long galleon flying a banner of a three-headed green dragon. Now, we do not see these ships, but the description tells us how the greens have co-opted the Targaryen sigil of the three-headed dragon, but instead of it being black or crimson, they made it green, which fittingly is also the color of their largest dragon, Vagar. Damon meets Otto on the same bridge where they faced off in episode two, and just like in that encounter, Rhaenyra arrives late after the others on Dragonback, landing Cyrax behind Otto's group and walks through these knights completely unafraid. Targaryen rulers traditionally arrived at their coronations on Dragonback, but that is something they could not manage for Aegon last episode, so Rhaenyra is proving she has a symbolic power of her own. Otto offers his terms, but Rhaenyra calls him a traitor and tosses his hand pin. Orwell produces a message sent from Alicent, the page that Rhaenyra tore out of the history book in episode one in the Godswood, the one describing their warrior queen in Nymeria, princess of the Rhoynar, who conquered Dorne and famously burned her fleet to keep her people in Westeros and promote peace. This page reads, lashed together with ropes and cables, Nymeria's fleet dispersed at the coming of the first storms, sweeping them across the sea, east, west, and south, into something invested pocket at the Basilisk Isles. Now the Basilisk Isles are a group of islands in the summer sea off the coast of Sotheros. That's the southern continent of this world. Another reminder that HBO does have in the works a Nymeria spinoff, so all the mentions of Nymeria this season is probably setting that up. But with this page, Alicent is using not her own words, but a memory these two women shared when they were still friends, and a historical example of a warrior queen bravely dismantling her most prized weapon, her fleet, in the name of peace, as she prays Rhaenyra will do by restraining her use of dragons. Damon again proposes fire against fire. It's no easy thing for a man to be a dragon slayer. But dragons can kill dragons and have. And this line is spoken with Luke, centered most in the background, who ends up being the first victim of dragon versus dragon conflict in the Civil War. But Rhaenyra echoes Daenerys, at least season seven Daenerys. When dragons flew to war, everything burned. I do not wish to rule over a kingdom of ash and bone. And so Damon snaps. Rhaenyra clears the room. We should note that all these conversations around the Song of Ice and Fire only come up when maesters and other witnesses are not in the room, explaining why they would not have shown up in the biased text of Fire and Blood. Damon chokes his wife. My brother was a slave to his omens and portents. Anything to make his feckless reign appear to have purpose. Dreams didn't make us kings. Dragons did. Yeah, Damon's perfectly inverting what Viserys told Rhaenyra, that dragons were not the root of their power, Daenys the dreamer was, and dreams are. And Rhaenyra realizes, I never told you. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, she's rubbing it in that Damon was never seriously considered to be Viserys' heir, otherwise Viserys would have shared Aegon's dream with him. All this time Rhaenyra had assumed that Damon must have known it too, and only now she realizes that she has this over him. Pluto TV has on-demand and linear channels curated by real people who select the movies and channels that you love. Some of your favorite binge-worthy shows and movies have their own channels that you can watch 24-7. Rhaenys tells Corliss, A stranger casts a long shadow over this family. 
Now, in episode eight, Rhaenys refused to look away from Veyman's corpse, preferring to stare at the stranger directly. Remember, in the Game of Thrones era, House Valarion isn't really around. We did go into the series knowing that we would be following a house stalked by the stranger. Corlys wants to retire and declare for no one, but Rhaenys says Rhaenyra is the one person showing restraint in all this. So when Corlys and Rhaenys join the council, they both now wear black to match Rhaenyra, both in mourning for Viserys, you could say, but also to telegraph their allegiance to the blacks. Bela and Reyna join Jace and Luke at the end of the table, which seems very choreographed, probably to show everyone in the room the future of the black succession through the Valarians. We should note this choreography also likely involved having Damon sit out of this council meeting to avoid his hot-headedness turning off Corlys or Rhaenys. Rhaenyra hopes for the support of houses Aaron, Stark, and Baratheon. Hope is the fool's ally. Both Aaron and Baratheon share blood with my house. Just a reminder that the Aarons married into the Targaryens through Rhaenyra's mother, Emma, who died in the first episode, and the Baratheons have always been close to the Targaryens, first through Oris Baratheon, Aegon the Conqueror's hand, and his granddaughter, Jocelyn Baratheon, married Viserys' uncle, Aemon, and their daughter was Rhaenys. Corlys glances back at his betrothed grandchildren and swears support for Rhaenyra, calling her your grace. And from his point of view, notice how Rhaenys stands directly behind Rhaenyra. So Corlys isn't just bowing to the queen, he's also bowing to his wife, the queen who never was. And Corlys announces a big strategic advantage that they have won control over the Stepstones and can blockade shipping lanes to King's Landing. Now, this is called the Gullet. This is a body of water between Dragonstone and Driftmark and Massey's Hook, connecting the Blackwater Bay to the Narrow Sea. Rhaenys offers to patrol the Gullet with Maelys, Jace offers to send himself and his brother to the Eyrie to King's Landing and to Storm's End. And notice, as he does, Luke looks like he's about to shit bricks. So Rhaenyra agrees. She sends Jace to talk with Lady Jane Arryn. This is the Lady of the Vale, whom Damon in episode five at the wedding said he wanted to talk about his claim of runestone. In the book, Lady Jane flat out denies Damon. And then Jace will go on to the younger Craig and Stark at Winterfell. We'll likely meet both Craig and Stark and Lady Jane in season two. Now, Rhaenyra advises her sons. It's been said that as Targaryens, we are closer to gods than to men. The Iron Throne puts us a touch closer, perhaps. But if we are to serve the Seven Kingdoms, we must answer to their gods. She makes them both swear on a religious text of the faith of the Seven to not fight. Now, Aegon the Conqueror adopted the faith of the Seven for the Targaryen family to make it easier for the noble houses of Westeros to accept Valyrian invaders. Despite what would happen, the family's tradition of polygamy and incest conflicting with the Septons. This is similar pragmatism coming from Rhaenyra here. However, we should note that the Starks are more aligned with the old gods. Three dragons depart Dragonstone, Vermax in front with Jace riding, and then I believe that's Maelys, Rhaenys' dragon, because I think you can see her white hair there. And then in the back, the noticeably smaller Arax, written by Luke. You can actually see Luke nervously turning his head around to get one last look at Dragonstone, and you cannot help but worry about this small dragon and this kid as they head into storm clouds. During all this, Damon heads into the Dragonmont, singing a Valyrian lullaby as he courts Vermithor. Again, this was Jaehaerys' dragon, and it's interesting for Damon to be the one courting Vermithor, because in the book, it's another character who does this. Also, Targaryens don't commonly have multiple dragons at the same time, except Daenerys with her three dragons, though she was a weird exception in all kinds of ways. Maybe Damon saw Caraxes slipping earlier and thought, eh, sorry old pup, time for me to level up so I can match Vagar. Now, as to why Damon is singing. Him courting his grandfather, Jaehaerys' dragon, takes us back to the opening scene of the season, the Great Council at 101, presided over by Jaehaerys at Harrenhal. And Jaehaerys likely also knew Aegon's Song of Ice and Fire. So now Damon may be singing his own Song of Ice and Fire as he claims another part of Jaehaerys' legacy. And he could see this with Damon reflected in Vermithor's eye and Vermithor reflected in Damon's eye. The poster of the series made the shape of the dragon eye, Aegon's dagger. So this is kind of Damon writing his own Song of Ice and Fire. We return to Storm's End. In the lightning, Luke sees Vagar's massive bulk outside the castle walls, looming over the battlements like freaking Godzilla, its jowls hanging low. Inside, Aemond is already chatting with Boros' daughter, Maris. The other three, Cassandra, Ellen, and Floris, are literally lined up as if Boros is auctioning them off to any prince who walks in. Boros calls for a maester to read Rhaenyra's message since he's illiterate. Get Leah Michelle a maester. Since Luke is already betrothed, Boros sends him away. Before he goes, Aemond taunts Luke, calling him Lord Strong, neither prince nor Valarian, and reminds him of his debt. I want you to put out your eye. Aemon One-Eye keeps a massive sapphire in his eye socket, showing us why his opening credits dial has included a sapphire. So while Rhaenyra and Alicent have an understanding, at least for now, their sons still bear the scars from their youths. It was Luke who brought in the pink dread, Luke who cut out Aemon's eye, Luke who laughed at the roasted pig in episode seven. He said this coming. And in episode four, in this same Storm's End round hall, we saw two young lords from Bracken and Blackwood draw swords on each other, spilling blood, though the younger lord was victorious there. So if you don't know what happens, this really does 
does feel like it could go either way. But Boris forbids fighting inside the keep, but that doesn't stop Eamon from pursuing. Actually, in the book, it's Maris Baratheon who eggs on Eamon. She asks, did Lucerys remove your balls as well as your eyes? Just why you gotta say anything, Maris? When Luke reads Oryx in the storm outside, now when the lightning strikes, no Vagar is visible. It's loose, waiting for him in the shadows. Like in Jaws or any great horror film, the monster is scariest when you don't know where it is. Director Greg Gutanis nailed the sequence with excellent usage of lighting, textures, and sound design. Setting heavy VFX sequences like this during rainstorms is always a smart move, despite the difficulties to the actors and the production crew, because lightning allows flashes to show the action, and water allows the surfaces to reflect the light better so that we can see everything more clearly, and the textures look more realistic that way. That's partly why the T-Rex attack in Jurassic Park and the Battle of Helm's Deep and Two Towers are so gripping and vivid. You see this usage of lighting and texturing, especially in this real wide shot as RX flaps away from Storm's End. One lightning strike shows us the tower, and then a few more reflect different parts of RX's body and wings to show it slowly moving away, like too slow. We're all watching this feeling, Jesus Christ, hurry, get the f out of there. And the storm also serves a practical function. Luke is sprayed with rain, making it impossible for him or for RX to see forward. As Luke looks around, dizzy, looking for Vagar behind him, Vagar is finally revealed, looming above them like a freaking Star Destroyer. This huge dragon passes completely overhead before Luke even sees it. And then Vagar rushes directly at them. <laughs> Yeah, notice how there was no music before this point, just the terrifying sounds of the storm. But right as lightning reveals Vagar's form rushing at us, we hear this percussive clash and Jawadi's music kicks in. Amond laughs and he taunts, I see you! Recalling that creepy glance he gave Luke in the courtyard in episode eight, Luke takes Arax through a narrow canyon where Vagar can't follow. And we get a close up of Vagar's reins, the netting of rope that's used to climb up onto the dragon. A reminder that these loose ropes are really the only way Amond can tug at Vagar to pilot the dragon and control Control it, and when ropes are wet, they're more elastic and less likely to pull taut. Luke loses control of Arax, who sprays fire at Vagar. <laughs> mistake, but an interesting layer of context that wasn't in the book. Eamon and Luke here do not want their dragons to kill each other, whereas in the book, Eamon isn't playing games. He is filled with pure homicidal rage and vengeance. This isn't a dance between the boys anymore. It's a dance of the dragons. Luke flies high above the storm clouds, and briefly he gets this heavenly view of it all, but it's a false victory. Damn. And again, they deliberately include Eamon screaming, Vagar, no, which is a huge contrast to the book Eamon, who goes even further to desecrate Luke's remains afterward. And he could just make out Luke's body falling among the bloody pieces of Rx. We're reminded of Luke's brother Jay struggling to translate the High Valyrian words for killed versus felled and not knowing the word for mouth. So Eamon screaming no is another example of this series softening these characters, making them less treacherous and bloodthirsty than they are in the text, so that we as viewers can better empathize with them as characters on several seasons of a TV series. You could read this as the producers learning lessons from Daenerys in the final episodes of Game of Thrones, who willfully committed war crimes on Dragonback, when just having Daenerys scream, Drogon, no, as Drogon torches King's Landing, might have been more true for her character. And I would argue make the conflict between her and Jon Snow in the final episode even more interesting, because he wouldn't be killing a freaking evil war criminal, he'd be killing someone whose power is just too out of control. But thematically for this series, House of the Dragon, I like how it keeps the focus on the dragon power as the chaotic threat that makes it impossible for even the most rational leaders to succeed. And it proves Viserys right, that dragons are too big for this world, and the idea that Targaryens can control dragons is a complete myth. The Targaryens are just lucky that dragons will let them ride them. This episode ends on Daemon telling Rhaenyra the news, and she stumbles a bit, as she clutches her stomach, as if that pain of losing her child is hitting her all over again. Also notice in the scene, Rhaenyra is not wearing the crown. She's reacting to this not as a queen here, but as a mother. And as she turns around in rage, any negotiation with the Black Queen is off the table. A painted table of Westeros, now lit from below, making it look like the continent of Westeros is on fire. And soon it will be. It has been a pleasure breaking down this season of House of the Dragon with you all. I so appreciate your patience waiting a day longer for a deeper dive from a nerd with just a plain American accent. Thanks again to Pluto TV for sponsoring this episode. Pluto TV offers free live channels and on-demand blockbuster movies. Stream now, pay never. Follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at EAVOSS. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.